Welcome. It's been a, it's a big week. Uh, we just had Ananya Roy on Monday, and tonight I'm just completely, really thrilled to welcome Adrian Lahoud um, to be presenting his work, both as an educator, as a theorist, as an architect, as a researcher, um, as the dean of the School of Architecture at the RCA in London, uh, and also, I think tonight we'll be speaking about his work uh, curating the inaugural edition of the Sharjah um, Architecture Triennial, uh, which will be held in November 2019. Uh, Adrian is um, a, a colleague, a, a friend, um, but also a kind of an intellectual uh, sort of partner for, um, for me, for myself, but also so many of our faculty, uh, and I, uh, we were you know, speaking recently about the two schools and this kind of interesting parallel and network that's uh, being woven uh, between the two schools, thinking about new forms of practice, thinking about how as architects we can bring a kind of critical stance to questions of scale, questions of environment, uh, and, and kind of act and engage uh, politically uh, our, our discipline. Um, and, and tonight I also want to take this opportunity to um, celebrate uh, CCCP, um, because it is the annual CCCP lecture, but also because this year marks the 10th anniversary of a small but oh so mighty program. Um, just, uh, as you know, co-directed by two of our uh, most kind of valued uh, uh, faculty and thinkers and here at the school, uh, Felicity Scott and Mark Wasuda, who together are, uh, you know, have crafted this unbelievable um, program that is, by the way, taking over the world in some power or certain kinds of certain parts of the world, certainly the critical curatorial part of the world. And, and I think that uh, unbelievable, again, network of friendships, of, of collaborators, of, of thinkers, um, I, 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 I think is, is becoming uh, is transforming the discipline uh, from within and its practice in so many ways. Um, so to, to really properly introduce Adrian, I want to welcome Mark to say a few words um, as well. And please uh, join me uh, in welcoming Adrian as well. Thanks, Amal. Thank you all for coming out. And thanks to Adrian for agreeing to deliver this, the yearly CCCP lecture. Um, I'm sure you will all soon grasp, uh, if it is not already clear, why we are excited to have Adrian here. By way of introduction, I want to point to a few things you should know about Adrian. He studied in Australia, where he was a brilliant and charismatic student, and I can, <laughs> I can attest to this. The first time I met him was at a conference he organized as a student. He became a scholar, researcher, writer, and opened a design practice. All was looking good, a nice life. Um, <laughs> and then the first sign of trouble. He moved to London where he became the director of the MA program at the Center for Research at Goldsmiths and worked with the Forensic Architecture Project. He then became the director, he then became the director of the Urban Design Program at the Bartlett School. Second sign of trouble, people are now a little concerned. Then he is suddenly at the RCA as the Dean of School of Architecture. Third sign of deepening trouble. Alarm bells are ringing and his friends are concerned. And finally he decides he will direct the first Sharjah Architecture Triennial. So asking Adrian to join us here is less invitation than it is intervention. <laughs> he may seem like a reasonable man, but really totally unhinged. An insane amount of work and responsibility. So we're feeling pretty good about this. You know, we're giving Adrian a break to at least momentarily stop this insanity. Yet this brief flickering moment of self-satisfaction quickly seeds to doubt, as it does. Because although the language and conception of intervention is not entirely unjustified or inaccurate, it is perhaps misplaced. I mean that from his previous work to his reconception of the urban design program at the Bartlett, to his introduction of research ventures at the, AC, or at the RCA on, for example, existential territories, to his curating of the Sharjah Triennial and the rights of future generations, it is Adrian who is intervening. He is an interventionist, as it were. 
In his research, in his scholarship, in the flurry of essays and exhibitions that he has recently authored, in his labor in and on institutions, his work appears as a coherent series of discursive, disciplinary, theoretical, and professional interventions into architecture, a series of interventions organized around politics, environment, climate change, and territory. Or put slightly differently, his work intervenes between and within the relationships, affiliations, associations, logics of connection and dependency that link architecture to environment and to politics. And just to carry this thought a little further, we also see in his work an idea of architecture that itself intervenes at various scales. Take this line that opens a recent text of Adrian's. There is a strange sympathy between the atmospheric particles that float through the sky and the human beings that migrate across the ground and then across the sea. Through this and myriad other strange sympathies, Adrian's work allows us to read architecture between the scale of the particle and the scale of global migration, between, say, Niemeyer's building project in Lebanon and the scale of state organization, between the descriptive climate model and the politics of imputed causality, between cybernetic networks in Chile and neoliberalism, or as a trap that coordinates structures and intervenes in the relationship between predator and prey. Thank you again, and please join me in welcoming Adrian again. Thank you so much um, for that incredible introduction. And thank you for the invitation to present here at the um, CCCP lecture. It's an honor to be here. Um, and it means a great deal to me to have this opportunity. I'd especially like to thank Dina Malandros, Mark, and Felicity for the invitation. Um, I also want to acknowledge colleagues like Godofredo Pereira, Lumumba de Arping, Moed Musbahi, Kasia Wolachik, Beth Hughes, and David Kim, whose thoughts and contributions will play a role in what I'm going to present tonight. I'm going to spend about 50 minutes um, discussing the inaugural edition of the Sharjah Architecture Triennial. It's a kind of work in progress. I know you're having midterms right now, so this is a kind of midterm presentation, so I look forward to the, um, to the feedback afterwards. I've divided the presentation into um, two sections with a dedication that you can see here. So the first section deals with what I call the preconditions for doing an exhibition like this. The preconditions are those problems posed by a post-colonial geography, by the dislocation and destruction of archives, and by the architectural exhibition itself in terms of its political economy, its conventional format, and its contents. In other words, the kinds of things you might be interested in when curating an exhibition of this type, regardless of the theme. The last part of the section, which is also the longest part of the presentation, is a reading of anthropological work on indigenous dwelling. Um, for the last three years, I've been trying to come to terms with the way that anthropologists talk about architecture. Um, the work prior to that on scale was really about how to do research. The work on anthropology is my way of coming at the question of design. The motivation for this work is to try to radically decolonize what we mean by architecture and design. That process has a goal which is to mobilize architectural education practice and research around alternative sociopolitical forms, to think the life of form in regards to the form of life. The second section looks at the proposal I made for the inaugural edition of the Sharjah Architecture Triennial and its theme, Rights of Future Generations. Um, the second part of the second section, which sounds like a Julius Eastman track title, um, explores some of the initiatives that we're undertaking, some of the discussions that we hope will become projects, and then I'm going to conclude by making some general statements. Okay, so the exhibition takes place in Sharjah, which is one of the United Arab Emirates. The city has played a crucial role in the networks of trade and exchange that have linked the East African coast to the Indian Ocean and to Southeast Asia for centuries. The diasporic networks of Sufis, Hadramauts, Bengalis, and many others link the three land masses that surround Sharjah, the African continent, the Arabian Peninsula, the Asian subcontinent, as well as the Malaysian and Indonesian archipelago. The intention behind the establishment of the Sharjah Architecture Triennial is to try to generate an indigenous critical dialogue on architecture and urbanism that looks at and builds on this historical network. So there are a number of different ways of designating the field of the project. Some are geographical. Um, for example, the idea of a region, 
um, which I find a bit paternalistic. You can put a hundred Swiss and Italian architects in the Arsenale every two years and it's still an international exhibition. Um, why? Because in this context, identity is the special burden of others who need to perform their cultural particularity in specific kinds of ways. So as many of you know, in the architecture exhibition, there is a kind of curatorial gaze in what I infer to be the non-regional part of the world um, that expects the regional part of the world to conform to a certain curatorial semiotic that over-identifies with cultural tropes and stereotypes around the vernacular and development, especially. These racialized discourses overcode architectural representation and expose themselves, therefore, to wholly legitimate critiques on the grounds of their essentialism and their paternalism. It's fair to say that in many ways, the large-scale exhibition is still a 19th century project. At the same time, Sharjah is an opportunity to create spaces for architects, artists, and scholars that have been denied opportunities because of where they live, because of where they are from, because of who they are, because of what they have done, written, or said. I would describe the scope and terms of the exhibition then as an attempt to look at problematic conditions rather than geographies, say. Though problematic conditions will always have geographical elements, they will also have deterritorialized components, elements that conflate scales, the near and far, the small and large, the weak and strong, but also importantly in light of this theme, relationships between the contemporary and the non-contemporary. So perhaps the most challenging of these preconditions is the legacy of the archival destruction and dislocation, a kind of precondition that is unique to former colonies and outposts of empire. So on June 7, 1962, on the eve of Algerian independence, the dean and the head, of li and the head librarian of the University of Algiers set fire to the university library, destroying 500,000 books in order to prevent them from falling into the hands of the Front de Libération Nationale and others fighting for Algerian freedom from French colonial rule. During the first year of the Nakba, some 70,000 volumes were looted from Palestinian libraries and collections. Eight years later, on Thursday, the 29th of May, 1956, one year prior to Ghana's independence, the governor's office of the Gold Coast instructs the colonial office to begin the process of separating, purging, and relocating and obliterating all the traces of documents that might embarrass Her Majesty's government, her secret collaborators, or the leaders, politicians, and officials of soon-to-be independent states. Titled Operation Legacy, the empire set about selecting, burning, and concealing its remains. It was one of the most systematic, comprehensive, and spectacular destructions of historical records known in our time. First in Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, then Ghana, then early in 1957, Malay, now Malaysia, then Tanganyika, now Tanzania, in 1961, Uganda in 1962, Kenya in 1963, and so it went. Archives were incinerated or migrated by the lorry load. On the 17th of December 2011, 170,000 volumes of the Institut d'Egypte, established in 1789, were destroyed by a stray Molotov cocktail thrown in the wake of clashes and the aftermath of revolution. Until the fire, the contents of this building, 200,000 volumes organized into physics, natural history, political economy, literature, and arts, and dating back to its establishment by Napoleon, remained a mystery to most. In the wake of the fire, priceless manuscripts emerged from their concealment littering the streets. The examples are endless. I, I, mean, I could continue for days. But the archive and its loss is not a theme of the exhibition. In fact, it is very simply the unavoidable precondition of doing work in the aftermath of destruction, in the aftermath of destruction's destruction. And it has very practical consequences for research. But it has also led to the emergence of artistic and intellectual practices that begin with the impossibility of testimony, with the unavailability of memories, with the traumatic blind spots and lacuna that characterize the post-colonial condition. The vast distortions that this history of destruction produces form another precondition of the project. What is left, what is left behind is often the testimony of the state, 
biasing towards a performative mode of international politics captured in conferences and large-scale events and overcoated by the state or its supra- and intergovernmental counterparts. Architecture biennials and triennials are a relatively recent phenomena. The first Venice architecture biennial, as you know, only took place in 1980. The coming year will be a witness, we will be witness to a veritable explosion in the number of large-scale exhibitions. Oslo, Seoul, Chicago, Venice, Lisbon, Shenzhen, Tallinn, Sao Paulo, Pamplona, Santiago, Buenos Aires, Asuncion, and Sharjah. The large-scale architecture exhibition has simply not had the same kind of history of anti-colonial or later post-colonial perspectives in comparison to the visual arts, nor was there an equivalent to the alternative circuit of cultural production, institutions, events, journals, and magazines that emerged within the visual arts, poetry, theater, and literature in the post-colonial period. For example, the first graphics biennial of Ljubljana, which took place in 1955, the Alexandria Biennial of the Mediterranean in 1959, which I've only just discovered. The first Arab Biennial um, held in Baghdad in 1974 in the context of the brief emergence of the United Arab Republic, through to more familiar events like Havana in 1984, but also to well-known exhibitions like Art and Artifact here in New York, curated by Susan Vogel in 1988, which I've spoken about before to Magician de la Terre, the Centre Pompidou, to Catherine David's Documenta 10, to Ocui's Documenta 11. And it's really thrilling to see how much work has been done in recent years to start to understand this history better, to understand the role that the visual arts played in establishing new networks of solidarity in the post-independence period, indeed during the period of decolonization itself. The Sharjah Art Biennial has been going for 28 years and very consciously builds on this history and a network of cultural production that exists with a significant degree of autonomy from global centers of institutional power. In fact, I would go so far as to say that it leads them in many ways. That history, that network, that working through of history simply has not occurred within our discipline. So this is an exciting moment, not just for the Sharjah, triennial, but for many of the other events that will be taking place at the same time, because I know many of my colleagues and many of my co-curators um, feel the same way, or at least recognize the same kinds of problems. And so the reason I mention this is because there is a risk that as a curator, which I'm not, but I'm playing at, um, one's role, there's a risk that we see one's role is simply supplying content to a pre-existing structure and therefore of working within a pre-existing political economy. In my admittedly hardly exhaustive experience of attending architectural exhibitions, it has often seemed to be the case that there is a lack of awareness of the preconditions that often overdetermines the content of the exhibition. And this is not just true for the broader conceptual and practical issues I've mentioned, but also with respect to all of the apparatus and paraphernalia of the exhibition itself, from the role of public relations, companies, journalists, communication strategies, visual identification, publishers, distributors, etc. Um, there is a kind of default machinery of narration, circulation, and value production that requires a huge effort to try to overcome in even the most modest of ways. The hegemony of the English language is, kind of, is a kind of excellent example. So decolonizing the exhibition will mean more than putting black and brown people in charge of curating exhibitions. It will mean more than declarations of inclusion, participation, and diversity. It must also mean subjecting the institution to a critical analysis directed toward a reorganization of its power and ultimately to the development of, an, of alternative infrastructures for the production of value in architecture. In its most general terms, we might understand the scope of this particular exhibition as a refraction between three kinds of poles, climate change, architecture, and colonialism. But more specifically, the kinds of diagrams, assemblages, and machines that are the real sites of struggle over vectors of collective subjectivation, their orientation, their stability, and their durability. At the heart of this is an attempt to expand the idea of architecture beyond its identification with building or more accurately, perhaps, to render less exclusive the purchase that buildings have over the history of architecture in order to incorporate alternative perspectives on modes of existence, on ecological modification, on environmental transformation. The challenge we have is how to capture something, that probably captures the wrong word, 
um, depict something like the long-term intergenerational modification of an ecosystem when these modifications are so subtle as to evade the ability of conventional forms of architectural representation to depict them, a problem that is all the more challenging as soon as one tries to represent something like a mode of existence. I'll talk a little bit about that later. The distinction between the human and the environment is a particularly Western European construct. Its presumed universality has been subject to long-standing critiques, so I'm not going to rehearse those arguments here. What I would like to argue, though, is that in this separation between the human and the environment, that it finds its ultimate analogy, its ultimate expression, if not its ultimate source, in architecture, particularly in the dominance of the concept of shelter. Deconstructing the idea of architecture as shelter is the most important and the most difficult step in decolonizing what we mean when we say architecture. The goal in doing so is to move some way toward acknowledging the vast existential and metaphysical diversity of human and non-human societies, including the way that their rights might be articulated. So I want to try to rehearse the outlines of that hypothesis for you now. take you through the argument. So, architecture's primary assumption. Protection from the natural environment is a kind of fundamental human need. Architecture's primary role, then, is to somehow satisfy this need. Therefore, let's grant the following. Shelter appears as the solution to the problem of protection from an environment. The problem is a kind of negative situation. You know? um, humans are cold, they're wet. They're exposed to predation, they lack privacy, etc. Shelter resolves this negative situation. So according to this assumption, at its origin, architecture emerges as a solution to a practical problem. Even if it gives rise to subsequent problems, they are somehow of a lesser importance. For example, how to correctly deploy the ionic, how to organize a school layout, how to encourage social interaction in an office lobby, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, shelter is in some way behind or below or above them all, such that if you don't have that first, you can't have the others later. Now, posing the problem in this way presupposes a subject-object, or if you like, environment-inhabitant, or even environment-organism distinction. Now, this ontological distinction separates the environment from the inhabitant. Further, it frames the environment in terms of a perceived risk. Now, one objection you could raise is that this doesn't offer any useful insights into societies that don't partition their world in the same way, and there are many. Now, one way out of this might be to claim that all the other things that architecture may or may not do are only possible once the rudimentary requirements of shelter are fulfilled. In other words, if architecture has any purpose beyond resolving the problem of exposure to potential harm posed by the environment, this purpose can only be fulfilled, be fulfilled once the problem of shelter is resolved. In this way, shelter becomes, and there is no other way to put it, the fundamental precondition for architecture. And this is maybe unsurprising. Buildings look like shelters, stubbornly, or at least to most of us. In Society Against the State, let's do this. In Society Against the State, Pierre Cluster has this to say. It has already been remarked that archaic societies are almost always classed negatively under the heading of lack. They are societies without a state, societies without writing, societies without history. Now, the notion of a subsistence economy conceals within it the implicit assumption that if primitive societies do not produce a surplus, this is because they are somehow incapable of doing so, entirely absorbed as they are in producing the minimum necessity for survival, for subsistence. Actually, what does subsistence mean? It means living in a permanently fragile equilibrium between elementary needs and the means for satisfying them. A society with a subsistence economy, then, is one that barely manages to feed its members and thus finds itself at the mercy of the slightest natural accident, such as drought or flood. A decline in its resources would automatically make it impossible to feed everyone. In other words, archaic societies do not live they survive. Their existence is an endless struggle against starvation, for they are incapable of producing a surplus because of a technological and beyond that cultural deficiency. Nothing is more persistent than this view of primitive society, and at the same time, nothing is more mistaken. <laughs> 
Shelter is to space what subsistence is to economy. Perhaps the first thing to say is that contrary to our use of the term, many of the indigenous societies described as, described as having subsistence economies were actually the very first leisure societies, the first affluent societies, to use Marshall Salen's phrase. The concept of shelter then is a symptom of a certain way of viewing the world that is violently projected onto the world. One that leads us to think about housing in terms of numerical supply, that makes us see homelessness in terms of spatial scarcity, or makes us see homelessness as shelterlessness, as if home and shelter were synonymous. It draws our attention away from alternative forms of domestic life because it frames the problem of domesticity in terms of a universal and primordial need, a numerical lack that must be addressed in numerical terms without ever putting into question the social models that underpin it, without trying to grasp in all their richness and complexity the forms of collective subjectivity that architecture proposes and naturalizes. Shelter converts life from an existential problem into a numeric, geometric, biological one. The image of the relief agency tent in situations of post-natural disaster and post-conflict returns like the primitive hut of the past to haunt every building with a premonition of its origin, its present and its future. In the favelas of Rio, Le Cabusia famously found evidence for the archaic persistence of a primitive type which he celebrated for its unadorned modesty and straightforward character. In fact, architects have often seen settlements of these kinds as archaic vestigial legacies of primitive buildings. The same is true of anthropology, which has tried to derive theories of Neolithic societies from contemporary indigenous modes of existence as if they had not been shaped by centuries, sometimes millennia, of contact with empire. In all these cases, the allegedly primordial character of the shelter carries a kind of erotic charge for the architect's gaze. The gaze is compelled, but the evidence it falls upon never fails to confirm its own narcissistic, paternalistic projections and fantasies. And no site has been more guilty of perpetuating these kinds of projections than the large-scale architectural exhibition, which, compelled by the now obligatory designator international, takes great pains to include more diverse forms of cultural representation that must include forms of slum re renovation or new school buildings in areas marked by poverty without ever unpacking the networks of NGO funding that these projects rely upon or the forms of cultural capital these images produce as they circulate through metropolitan centers and their systems of value production, forms of cultural capital that only those mobile enough to move between these two poles are able to benefit from. It is as if shelter, more than any other concept, secures the moral value of architecture. It is that self-evident good that architecture bequeaths to the world. It is what ultimately saves it from a more critical appraisal of the political economy that it is installed within and which it continues to serve. Any decolonization of architecture is going to have, is going to, have to reckon with this moral, conceptual, political legacy. Its legacy is that it pre-formats our attention it directs it away from the question of modes of existence. It relegates their diversity, their temporality, their metaphysics, their ecological concepts to a problem of the heart, a term that is now so discredited within contemporary archaeology and anthropology as to elicit shame. So let's take a more, well, an example from the ethnographic literature to try to make this idea of a mode of existence more concrete. So this is an image of the aftermath of a fire in a palm oil plantation in Borneo, where one of the studios in our environmental architecture program is, at the RCA is conducting a four-year-long investigation. So in looking at images like this, we recall the violence of extractive processes taking place across the planet, the legacy of environmental destruction, of degradation, of pollution, etc. But in all the discussions that have taken place recently, especially with respect to what is called the sixth great extinction event, we have completely failed to pay attention to something that should be close to our hearts as architects, which is the extinction not only of certain animal species, but certain modes of existence. <clears throat> 
So this is a longhouse, a dwelling often found in Borneo and Papua. The longhouse is an entire building, an entire village, in a single building. It's over 100 meters long and divided along its length into a circulation and domestic space. This image dated 1910 to 1912 was taken by a Finnish sociologist. So according to Peter Metcalf, who's written one of the key ethnographic accounts of the longhouse, newborn children are evenly distributed to every corporate group in the longhouse. A child be born of the social group, not the couple, able couples with less children could take new ones. As for the building, every 15 to 20 years, the entire thing is torn down and a new one is raised. Now what I want to try to do is just draw your attention to a completely typical, unexceptional aspect of the building, the line in the joints between the floorboards. Now architects spend a lot of their time thinking about lines and joints, about their craftsmanship, their intrinsic value, even their truth. And I wish I could say these kinds of things about this joint, but actually when you look at it, it's probably pretty unexceptional. After all, the planks are uneven, they're crooked, they're rudely butted together. It's fair to say that most of us would think this was the mark of no design at all, the mark of no skill, no craftsmanship, or you might consider yourself to be among the enlightened ones. You might argue that on the contrary, its very basic quality is precisely what makes it valuable. That perhaps its direct, modest, bare, unadorned quality is what makes it intrinsically, self-evidently truthful. As you can see, there are all kinds of value judgments that we can make about this rather typical, unexceptional feature of the building. In the case of the longhouse from Borneo, this joint is actually rather exceptional. I would say astonishing even. But in order to recognize its value, we need to try to do something, which is in some minimal form to take up the perspective of the social group that lives in the longhouse. In the case of the longhouse from Borneo, this joint marks the boundary between neighboring corporate groups. So the line describes an allocation of space to the corporate group in question, not its ownership. So when I said that the longhouse as an entire village in a single building, I lied. That's not quite correct. In fact, it is an entire village in a single room. Well, at least from our perspective, or in a series of rooms from the perspective of its inhabitants. In fact, it depends on how you define the room to begin with. More accurately, it is only a single room if you define a room by the presence of walls. If you define a room as a three-dimensional envelope of privacy, it is in fact multiple rooms. So each corporate group occupies one of the rooms along the sequence. Now at this point you might ask, how can you have privacy without the presence of walls? Well, every corporate group acts as if it is prohibited from observing its neighbors. And I deliberately use the subjunctive mode as if here to point to the fact that this is a description of observations in an ethnographic context, one that registers a comparative difference and a distance between the ethnographer and the informant. It's not an ontological claim, nor can it be. So to sensibilities that we are more familiar with, it is as if the corporate group exists in a condition that is completely devoid of privacy. Instead, it feels like a very intimate condition. After all, it looks like a single room, a bait, a rather long one. But then our thinking, feeling, and looking has been shaped by other kinds of histories. So can we trust our thinking, feeling, and looking to make sense of theirs? Is privacy possible without walls? Well, it seems as if it is. Peter Metcalfe's book on the longhouse retells a common occurrence. Families that might live every single day of their lives in what we would describe as the same space, merely 10 or 15 meters away from each other, will refuse to acknowledge each other when they're in the domestic zone of the longhouse. According to Metcalfe's account, if they bump into each other outside of the house, they will often exclaim, it's really so great to see you, I haven't seen you for a long time. Metcalf perhaps wisely refrains from any further speculation. But to my mind, the unanswerable questions simply multiply. Do the corporate groups of the longhouse act as if they refuse to look? Do they actually assiduously avert their eyes? Or do they act as if they refuse to acknowledge that they look? Do they act as if they look but refuse to see? 
Is that the purpose of the exclamatory greeting? Is the exclamatory greeting a figure of speech? Does it point to something more profound? Is there a difference? Etc. Etc. The point here is not to assume that we have access to some truth behind this, but to point to the differences and complications as a site of ethnographic speculation about alternative modes of existence. Indeed, what would be the difference then between looking and seeing, and what does it mean in terms of our concept of privacy or theirs? So I'm not sure it's just a simple joint in the floor of a dwelling. If we visited, we would barely notice it. Indeed, the curious thing is, and this may well be the case, that the corporate groups of the longhouse barely notice it as well. It may well be that this joint could just be a completely typical, unexceptional aspect of their dwelling. It's just the way they live if one were living as part of that mode of existence unique to the longhouse. The comparative method operates in the opposite direction just as equivocally. Indeed, as Patrice Menugelier has argued, comparative anthropology is just a form of rigorous equivocation. It's just another name for equivocation as practice. If social forms are never fully present to themselves, let alone to ethnographers, let alone to architects, let alone to architects reading about ethnography, what about more familiar kinds of conditions? Dwellings of the kinds that might be more familiar to you and I that depend on walls for their privacy. If that is the case, does that mean that we act as if we believe that our own eyes are not to be trusted? Do we distrust our own seeing, looking and feeling? After all, if our seeing, looking and feeling could be trusted, what need would we have of walls? Is the wall a mark of the eye's unreliability? Should we read the absence of a wall as a sign that the eyes of others can be trusted? Or perhaps what kind of society is so lacking in trust that it needs to build these physical things called walls to block the sight of others to do the work of socially unreliable eyes? And indeed, as you look through the anthropological literature on architecture, literature on forms of dwelling that are considered so lacking in merit, so underdeveloped by architectural scholars, they are almost completely absent from histories of architecture, what you will find is that the difference between the physical materiality of architectural elements and a multiplicity of customs, habits, behaviors, actions, and rituals was somehow substitutable. It is as if they were interchangeable, one always ready and poised to do the work of the other. In a wonderful reference that was only pointed out to me yesterday by my colleague David Kim, Yale Law School professor and civil rights activist Robert Cover writes the following. The very act of constituting tight communities about common ritual and law is juris generative by a process of juridical mitosis. It seems to me that one important way of thinking alternative modes of existence is to begin to map the couplings and disarticulations of what Kova calls the juris generative and what we might more simply call design. Take this abate rather speculative assemblage of eyes, glances, habits, rituals, laws, and architecture and tell me how one could separate them from the mode of existence in which they operate. Any other kind of designation of value is little more than an exercise in institutional authority, in the power to depict, to credit, and to judge. The only solution, then, is to try to allow the very definition of architecture within the mode of existence that we define as our own, such as the primordial function of shelter or the exclusive association with building, to be thrown into doubt, to enter into an equivocal relationship with others. After all, if a complex set of interpersonal social actions are organized around a joint in the floor of a longhouse, then what about a stick in the ground? What about upturned leaves? What about twisted branches? What about a geoglyph? What about a painting? Where does architecture start and the environment begin? Existing curatorial and exhibition-making strategies for large architectural exhibitions rely on formats that were developed in predominantly Western European and North American contexts. These formats reproduce preconceptions on what counts as architecture and how architectural value is established by reinforcing aesthetic norms, excising environmental or social contexts, or by focusing on Western definitions of te technical accomplishment and virtuosity. For example, the way transformations of the environment by indigenous peoples do not take the forms of building, or the way that non-Western architecture is constrained to questions of craft or the vernacular. 
as a consequence, the concepts, rituals, aesthetics, environments, social contexts, and technical systems that characterize non-Western architectural cultures are either lost or forced to conform to existing models. In its most simple terms, rights of future generations claims that present generations have a responsibility to future generations and that this responsibility primarily pertains to the state of the planet, its ecosystems and its environment. The claim emerges due to a growing recognition that the planet, its ecosystems and its environments are being destroyed and that this destruction severely constrains the ability of future generations to live their lives. The rights claim appears primarily in the preambular parts of conventions and treaties, which speaks to two things. First, that it remains largely aspirational, and second, that it presents conceptual difficulties that have posed issues for practical legal implementation. And this challenge is usually expressed in two very simple ways. First, in terms of definition, how do you define a future generation? And second, representation, so who will speak on behalf of future generations in the present? The UN Charter, as you can see here, refers to succeeding generations immediately in its preamble. What the reference to future generations marks here may simply be the following, that these rights being claimed in the present shall continue to exist and apply in the future, which is to say that rights of future generations might be thought in their weakest form simply as a kind of sign of the perpetuity of rights themselves. Conversely, you might also argue that the futurity in being marked is not a claim for the longevity of rights, but rather that futurity itself, the very potential to make plans and organize activity around a goal, is profoundly human. The forward-looking orientation of rights is as a registration of this human quality. Or in a similar vein, as the legal scholar Samuel Schleffer argues, the very idea that things will continue after we die is a kind of precondition of what matters to us in the present, therefore by extension, what should be accorded rights, and therefore that we in the present imagine that future persons will experience or be subject to a comparable sense of importance and by extension, responsibility. Rights are often seen rights are often seen as requiring a corresponding duty which seems to pose a problem when the duty's reciprocation exists outside of the lifetime of the rights bearer. In a recent book, Matthias Fritsch attempts to reconcile both normative and ontological cases for theories of intergenerational justice by developing a concept of turn-taking and asymmetrical reciprocity in response to this problem where asymmetry refers to a kind of passing on of the obligation to future generations which in philosophical terms I think is a really rich idea insofar as it can be read to imply that either the right never returns to you because you pass it on, or more provocatively perhaps that its chain of bearers are some important way substitutable for each other, a view that would trouble a straightforward linear view of generations succeeding each other. I want to try to point out something else that I find unique about the claim of rights of future generations, neither in terms of its legal normativity or its ontological implications, but rather in terms of the kinds of political work that it might be made to do. So rather than try to settle on a rigorous definition, I want to try to describe this in terms of the productive tension that it produces between the idea of filiation and alliance. So a future generation can be easily understood on a visceral level because human beings have children and we have experiences of children being born. I know families are machines for reproducing all kinds of neurosis um, and especially in respect to intergenerational relationships, they're channels for the transmission of inherited wealth, social capital, social credit, and therefore they play a really important role in perpetuating inequality and we can discuss that later. But, and this is also important, they are also sites of enormous effective investment, attachment, care, commitment, and it must also be said, love. So the intergenerational perspective is also a site of immense conflict and violence, as in anti-miscegenation laws, but also as in stolen generations, forced removal and adoptions. So future generation occupies an uncertain space insofar as it breaks with filiation, 
while allowing for the various attachments, structures of care, and commitments affiliation to be invested in it. This slippage between the visceral affective register affiliation and the temporal uncertainty of alliances with those yet to come becomes a productive site of political work. So too with the scalar tension between the plurality of conceptions of rights, futures and generations in distinct sites of social struggle and the claim for rights of future generations as such. Both are examples of what the political theorist, theorist Ernesto Leclerc would call chains of equivalence in reference to his work on left-wing populism. That is to say, their concept, or better yet, refrains, that allow specific sites of struggle with their particular demands and claims to see themselves as coextensive with the entire terrain of social struggle. That process has another name. That name is solidarity. Okay. Some of the projects. So the commissioning process has been less about selecting work or architects, and I think more about establishing small communities of inquiry around certain conditions that you know, um, we think are important. Um, I can give you a really small selection of the kinds of discussions that are taking place rather than talk about the work themselves because this is, um, as I said before, a midterm crit. Um, okay. So the Noara canvas is an eight by 10 meter painting produced by the Noara people of Northwestern Australia. It was produced as evidence of land tenure in a native title claim. After the saltwater collection, we believe it was only the second time in Australian history that a cultural artifact was used as evidence of land tenure. This painting is the most astonishing thing and unsettles common understandings of the relationship to country of the intersection between European and indigenous legal orders, between the territory and notions of its representation. Law in indigenous Australian society is subject to secrecy and processes of initiation. In order to produce the painting, the different custodians of the law needed to make a decision on how much of the law to reveal to each other and to the native title commission. Each of them then go on to, to paint a particular section of the painting in collaboration. The painting then is an adaptation of an indigenous legal order that is calibrated to the requirements of a European legal order. Moreover, the custodians require that the commission take place in country, since this is the only way they could speak to the country, this is the only way they could testify. This meant that the Australian Native Title Commission had to move the entire hearing to the desert. The case was decided in their favour, and the commission noted that it was the most eloquent piece of evidence entered into an Australian court. We've been working on this project since September with our team. Um, I was first alerted to it in an excellent essay called The Truth in Painting by Kirsten Anker, which you should read. Um, what we hope to do, and we're still some way from achieving it, is to try to exhibit the canvas alongside a commissioned work that also speaks to the court case in order to complicate Australian evidentiary paradigms and the forms of cartographic representation that are associated with land tenure, such as surveys and title deeds. Um, Marina Tabasum is leading a project on the intersection of the Meghna and Pabna, Padma rivers in Chandpur in Bangladesh. As with most deltaic rivers, the littoral between the water and land is continually moving its location. As the river bank moves forward, it literally swallows the settlements along its edge. They crash into the river and are carried away. As the river bank retreats, the various households rebuild new dwellings in their newly available land. Now what is interesting to us is that there is an intergenerational understanding of land tenure that is relatively well defined under highly dynamic conditions. So for example, older generations will point to the middle of the river and they'll say that's our property over there, knowing full well that in the coming decades their descendants will come and reoccupy the, um, the land. So the project is a kind of allegory for our times, um, which is how to coexist in a radically variable environmental condition. How do parcels of property superimpose on a deltaic condition in intergenerational time? How are they measured? How are disputes resolved and negotiated? How does inheritance function? What are the environmental impacts in terms of toxicity, etc.? cetera? 
The final commission I want to mention um, examines Bali's complex system of rice irrigation, especially the encounter between the Green Revolution, whereby Western corporations funded by international aid programs would supply the developing world with chemical fertilizers insecticides with the aim of dramatically improving crop yields and eradicating poverty. And the Balinese system of subbaks and religious temples that control water flow in the island through a ritualized system of a series of complex calendrical cycles. And the work was inspired by um, the writings of an anthropologist and Santa Fe alumni um, called Stephen Lansing, especially a book called Priests and Programmers. So as Adam Jasper writes, according to Lansing, the entire island functions like a giant computer that perfectly synchronizes the physical and cultural life of the island. Lansing saw the island as the perfect expression of a democratic, ecological, and self-organizing system, and he developed one of the very first environmental hydrological simulations in the world to prove it, which it did, apparently. Indeed, Lansing and his colleagues were instrumental in making the case that the Green Revolution would soon decimate Balinese rice irrigation and take Balinese society with it. In order to persuade the various national and international bodies that rice yields on the island could not be increased, he presented a simulation that explored various spatial temporal distributions of rice, water, and pests. According to the simulation, the computer would eventually alight upon the most perfect, most efficient configuration. When it finally did that, the plan it generated reproduced almost to the very last detail the already existing configuration of Bali systems of irrigation channels and rice fields. And you can make of that what you will. To mention very quickly two more projects, we're discussing a project on experimental social systems, especially eco-feminist agricultural cooperatives in the context of the Zapatistas of, of Chiapas, the Kurds of Rojava, um, Lebanon's Bekaa Valley and Tunisia with Marwa Asenios. Um, and we're also discussing a project on Gaza and trying to understand and represent the spatial temporal conflation of scales at work in the Gaza blockade and protests, and especially to try to understand and explain the long-term consequences of maiming on the population inspired by the extraordinary work of Jasbir Pua and also led by Francesco Sebregondi. A quick conclusion. At its most fundamental level, climate change is the consequence of societies that have learned to apprehend the world in the most fatal and reductive of terms as nothing more than a resource to be exploited. The dominance of this perspective already leads many beings to exhaustion. Soon it will lead them all to extinction. What processes have brought the world to this point? How is it that a single perspective has come to dominate all others? After all, human history has furnished us with countless examples of alternative social orders, of relationships between humans and other beings that evolved according to different beliefs and commitments, ones that refused to collapse life into a resource. What has brought us to this point, to the point of ecological collapse, is the consequence of a single perspective colonizing all others. This process is as yet incomplete and alternative perspectives courageously struggle to survive everywhere we turn. These ongoing struggles are a gift to those who are ready to receive them. They indicate the very last sites of experimentation with alternative social orders, with perspectives on the relationships between humans and other beings that are not predicated in exploitation. Our task is to align ourselves with these sites and to imagine what is possible beyond the existing arrangement of things. Extractive relationships between beings are a learned pathology reinforced by the social, technical, and mental ecologies we inhabit and that we continue to unthinkingly, unfeelingly reproduce. Without addressing the challenges posed by this state of affairs, without identifying the fact that the present state of affairs is not an accident of history, but rather a war waged on social, technical, and mental lines, a war waged against those beings in order to condition them to accept their exploitation, a war, in the words of the Invisible Committee, on the front that exists within every one of us, we will never understand climate change on its proper terms as the symptom of the eradication of alternative perspectives on what it means to live <coughs> and to coexist with others. Architecture's role in all of this might turn out to be important, but its latent potential to imagine, propose, 
and rehearse alternative forms of coexistence must be disarticulated from the political economy it is currently installed within. In, or in doing so, it is offered the chance to align itself with existing sites of social struggle and social experimentation. In order to accomplish this task, we have to ask questions that risk unsettling the existing order of relationships between architecture and these precious spaces of experiment. These encounters are not without risk. The very definition of what we mean when we say architecture will not emerge untroubled or unsettled as a consequence. Thank you. As I said before we start, I'm gonna take the initiative here from my two colleagues that Mark gave a very, very um, generous introduction. What you don't know is that um, in the formation of this, in my mind, I was often Skyping with Mark with what I thought were really exciting discoveries about curation and exhibition making. And you know, he's so patient, and all his students know this already, but um, <laughs> he was really generously having these discussions with me, and I really feel like that for Mark, it must have felt like Adrian had just discovered warm water. <laughs> <laughs> but he never let on. So thank you. Uh, that's that's n not at all super sweet. Just I would say like as a mid review, you're doing all right. <laughs> um, yeah, no, super challenging program project talk, yeah. and and um, and full of so many risks and yeah. traps. I would say it's sort of hard to know where to intervene, but. Um, Maybe just to start, because I just I kept coming back to this when you're speaking, like the, the model of the joint, which, <laughs> which was so important in your explanation of what we might mean by a different registration of architecture, a different registration of the detail, uh, was was super uh, a super effective illustration because, in a way, in order to understand the different spatiality, the different sociality of that longhouse and of the family, which was not the Victorian family, mm -hmm. um, we had to understand the mode of vision that would occupy mm. that space socially and politically. And so we had to see a mode of seeing that we were not accustomed mm. to seeing. Um, and so the way that you get us there is by explaining that process through a set of diagrams that are themselves a, a mode of seeing, mm. a mode of seeing that we inherit and borrow yep. from anthropologists who yep. draw social relations. And, and so the just to say that the way in which we have access to that seeing is through a complicated mediation of modes of seeing. Um, and, and ones that cycle through the very disciplines that we also want to unsettle yeah. and potentially decolonize. <laughs> exactly. So I started to think about the exhibition as a mode of seeing mm. and, and wondered how and I'm not saying you should have an answer to this because this is the project is to think through this, yeah. not to answer this. But I wondered how one would display that joint in an exhibition that was trying to decolonize our assumptions mm. about seeing. And not only decolonize our assumptions about seeing and what the, let's say, the social and political dimensions of seeing are um, in relation to family structures, sure but also to decolonize the form of vision or to alter or critique the form of vision that is manifest within the exhibition or yeah. the exhibitionary complex. So how do you use the exhibition, which has already trained us to see in a certain way, mm -hmm. to see something else, to see a mode of seeing that we don't know how to see? And yep. so this seems like <laughs> the, the incredibly interesting and challenging paradox of the project that you're up against. And, 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 and I'm sure the discussions you're having always circle back around this, but, but I'm just wondering, like, at a, to revert to like, a very straightforward curatorial perspective, have you thought how you do that? How do you shift the registration of seeing within that space? Yeah. 
No, it's an, that's like a really key question. And I think, first of all, it's important to say that I think it's, it's a genuine problem. Um, it's not like I have an answer um, because I think it's a, it's a difficult thing to do. Um, and like everything else, I don't, I guess what I presented tonight is a series of processes that we put in motion, um, mm -hmm. some of which will, um, will manifest in the, in, the, in the exhibition, but many maybe will not. Um, so, so my response, like with, like with everything else, is to, um, to start to do a bit of research on actually just the elements of the exhibition. So I didn't present this tonight at all. Um, the first version of, this, of, of the presentation tonight was about you know, 17,000 words, so it would have been about three hours worth of, um, and then I realized it was, I had to kind of viciously cut it down. Um, so there's a research project that we're doing, which is called the image object, um, which is really trying to think through the question of um, like the elements of an architectural exhibition. So for example, um, and I guess one of the important things to, to, to register in what you're saying is that it's it's a kind of it's always an encounter with two different forms of seeing, right? The one that you're enculturated within, and then the one you're trying to depict, right? So it's not like you start from nothing. It's a kind of there's a kind of comparative moment, yeah. Um, and and the trick is is how you make that figure ground oscillate, yeah. So you throw your own, and that's I guess that's what I was trying to say about equivocation. Like how do you throw your own mode of seeing into doubt? Yeah such that you might register other modes of seeing right, within, an, within an exhibition setting. Um, and I think that's really difficult if you rely on models, drawings, and <laughs> images. Um, because it's true that if you walk into, you know, if, if you look at the plan of a longhouse, yeah, I mean, no matter, un unless you like look at that really seriously and, and, and read around it, you're not gonna read that existential condition within it. Um, and the same is true for every architectural plan. I mean, and, you know, and, and you know, we're all, you know, um, really familiar with the history of architecture. And so you can read a plan, you can look at the history of buildings, the, the kind of type um, of, 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 um, of building, you understand if it's a school type, you understand the kind of histories of education that means certain kinds of spatial organizations, et cetera, et cetera. Like that part's, that part's um, straightforward, you know, but you have, but it's a kind of expert, form of seeing, mm. yeah? Um, and the idea that somehow we can just put plans in exhibitions and that those things are legible um, to non-experts, that somehow some kind of really, um, you know, a kind of form of collective subjectivity is visible in the floor plan. No, I mean, that's also, that, that's, that's not true, simply, um, for most people. Um, and so, I just wanted to come back to the, um, yeah. the seeing question. Um, I mean, I was also struck by your use of um, anthropological documents um, in that presentation, or your use of um, the image of the primitive hut, you know, not necessarily the Lajin ones, that, yep. you know, the, um, but the question of how one um, both inhabits by necessity the Western epistemology or the disciplinary histories or, or even um, exhibition apparatuses and norms, and yet mm -hmm. simultaneously um, uh, shakes them out of their certainty is the question. And so in performing a lecture, um, uh, you know, you can navigate that space through uh, provoking other, you know, proposing mm. other questions, mm. uh, producing juxtapositions. And the question of how that could or whether that should translate into the the exhibition strategy, the, the, the seeing question, I mean, you know, yeah. how you can actually produce a visual deconstruction in a way that um, yeah. that mirrors or amplifies or potentially does something like radically different to the type of interpretive deconstruction that you know one can perform yeah. in text or in voice. Yeah. And, and it's a um, like it's a fundamental question. It's a right? really big question. Yeah. And, but it's um, the fundamental question of the exhibition somehow. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I think um, you know when you organize you know you walk into the arsenal and there's like 400 models in a row lined up <laughs> for a kilometer. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, you, you, you can't help but have banal aesthetic mm -hmm. judgments, um, especially after the 50th. <laughs> it's like, I like the roof, I don't like the roof. You know, it's like, it's, <laughs> it's kind of hard to see beyond that. Um, and so, so what, is, what is an exhibition when, um, in the absence of a kind of, um, uh, of a kind of architect, you know, mm -hmm. to kind of mm -hmm. perform um, mm -hmm. a kind of explanation? Yeah, 
Um, so that's the kind of curatorial question. And I think that's exactly what we're working on. Um, and I think that there is, you know, this very famous image of um, Le Corbusier pulling a cell of the unité um, out of the structural frame of the unité. Yeah, it's like, mm -hmm. It, it kind of inaugurates a thousand cliches, you know? It's like, it's, from then on, you have all of these images of like hands doing things to architectural models, right? Mm -hmm. um, for, mm -hmm. to, to, like, even now, it's a kind of trope. Um, and what does that speak to? That, that simply speaks to the kind of necessity of the kind of um, a, a mediator or an interlocutor that exists between the project and its audience. Mm -hmm. um, how do you do that in the case of an exhibition? Yeah, is a really interesting question. Um, and we think, and it's a hunch, um, that actually if there's anything that speaks to that kind of existential condition, it's probably cinema rather than architectural forms of representation, or at least moving image in some way. Um, so there's something around the intersection between moving image um, and, and also, let's say, like also to move away from a reliance on not not only on like conventional forms of representation, but let's say on a kind of, um, a kind of homo homogeneity of the kinds of materials that, might one that, might, might one, that one might want to present in an exhibition. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's to allow tensions to register between things like documents, models, moving mm -hmm. image, et cetera, et cetera. And maybe the last thing to say, which is I think is also incredibly important, um, is, is actually that the, the context of the exhibition is is also the is the space of the exhibition itself, you know? and that somehow that's something that I think architectural exhibitions somehow always Im like um, large scale architectural mm -hmm. exhibitions somehow imagine a way, mm -hmm. um, and allowing that kind of that that tension between the, the not only the institutional context but the physical context of the exhibition and the material to resonate differently might be. Um, might be one way of of, of, of doing that, um, but it's a really I think it's again it's a really difficult question. I don't know. I don't, definitely don't have a kind of answer for it. Um, all I know is there's a kind of set of things that we're interested in. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, anyway. We don't have answers either. Um, but, I, you know, I think it's a... Um, Actually, can I say one other thing? Please, go ahead. Yeah. Um, like, another really banal way of framing it is, like, the, this kind of... Um, it's like the problem of how come there's no people in, like, architectural photo photography, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, actually, like, when, when have we ever taken seriously the role of the figure, right, within the architectural image? Um, and even, even if you look at everything from Russian avant-garde mm -hmm. theater to um, post-war cinema, that relationship between the figure, the prop, and the set um, enters into some very, very strange relationships, no? so where sometimes it's very difficult to, to work out, like, who is the agent? Yeah, who is the motivating force? Is it the background? Is it the foreground? Is it the mm -hmm. subject? Is it the prop? You know, and at different times they'll oscillate. You know, Bresson's injunction to his, to his um, actors, which is like, act like models, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And or something like last year, Marienbad, where it's almost indistinguishable you know, the, the statues on one hand and then the, the actors um, are as kind of immobile within the frame. So there's something around mm -hmm. that kind of, that, that a really, I think, a complex set of relationships which have barely started to look at within architecture around the figure, the prop, and the, and the, um, and the setting for architectural representation, where I think there's just interesting research work to be done. I don't know if, what will come of that. Yeah. But, um, this is not a question, but uh, I kept um, thinking when you were, um, when you asked the question, how does inheritance function toward the end, yeah, towards your conclusion, mm. and, um, and you, you know, you trace various forms of um, filial inheritance and mm. the uh, constitutive inequality that comes, uh, no. um, uh, that's born out of those social norms on the one hand, and mm. uh, at the same time, the forms of effective uh, relationships that are also, uh, that also tend to attend them. And it, and it struck me that um, um, in different you know, parts of the presentation, of course, you're also speaking to uh, different, different registers of inheritance, into in the institutional inheritance, vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis questions of exhibition making, disciplinary inheritance in terms mm -hmm. of um, architecture yeah, as a disciplinary framework yeah. that, that you know, also comes with these um, um, forms of exclusion and uh, affiliation, etc., and, and, and expectations, <laughs> but also uh, potentially forms of sort of affect that can yeah. be put to work otherwise. And, yeah. and I, I was 
was wondering if there's not um, also a type of lesson coming out of your very beautiful reading uh, of the longhouse and the, mm. the sort of comparative method of the longhouse that that allows us to you know equally estrange the Victorian room as it, yeah. as it does to put pressure on the sort of gaze of the anthropologist. I'm yeah. wondering if the um, each of these um, um, registers and there's many others at play, and I mm. think that's in a way why it's sort of difficult to respond because your mm. your, your your reading does this beautiful um, um, uh, produces this beautiful entanglement of all the different dimensions of the problem of putting on the triennale, much like the the reading of the mode of life or the form of life, you know, mm. dissolves into so many components in order to be legible. So, but mm. but these were three that I sort of tried no. to draw out. Um, mm. So without trying to um, produce a sort of epistemic violence in categorizing them so clearly into okay. institutional disciplinary and, and the sort of filial in terms of the intergenerational, I'm, sure. um, you know, wondering if, if there, you know, isn't some way, um, yeah, of performing something similar, yeah? Yeah. This is the discipline, this is and I don't know what that would look like, but again, I keep, um, there's also really taken by the dismantling of notions of, of shelter, you know, on the one hand, mm. if you took that towards the, the sort of biopolitical replacing mm. the, um, exactly. the semiotic, and, yep. you know, we, we sort of know where, where that goes. It, also seems that um, shelter is one of these terms that that um, already marks us as having Western epistemology, yeah. obviously, um, but that also, um, um, for many of us trained within architecture, comes with a slight discomfort, yeah, and mm. like, and so the discomfort that we experience, thinking, oh my God, we're going to talk about shelter and <laughs> and, uh, and we're not uncomfortable because we know that these terms, you know, arise in the context of a certain 19th century, you know, experience of the other, but, but it is also sort of partially why yeah. it makes us uncomfortable, because yeah. the embrace of these terms, I mean, I'm not saying you're embracing them, you're deconstructing no. them, but no. the embrace of these terms also um, uh, often channels archaisms that are, yeah. you know, forms of racism or forms totally. of uh, exoticization or totally. forms, yeah, I mean, and so, yeah. so I think there's a way in which the slight discomfort that um, um, I mean, maybe this is just biographical, having worked on Rudofsky and having people yeah. think I work <laughs> and, on like you know, vernacular architecture, not, not yeah, modernism, yeah. but, but uh, <laughs> you know, I think there's sort of a, something about that discomfort, like, oh, where is he going? Is he heading towards the romantic? Yeah. No, oh, he's not. Okay, but so why, why are these terms coming with, yeah? Like, how are they interrupting our certainties or how are they, yeah, um, yeah destabilizing the the sort of terms of when we think, you know, we've got past that, oh no, we, no, we still have to deal with this, it's still yeah. haunting, um, something like the possibility of, of an exhibition um, that, that tries to take into account of, um, you know, residual forms of paternalism vis-a-vis -vis Africa, Asia, yeah. <laughs> I mean, so, mm. you know what I mean? So I'm yeah. just wondering if there's something about the, the um, uh, I don't know, that way of making people uncomfortable that mm. is not productive. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I think, I think... I mean, I'd be more uncomfortable if you were talking about, like, rotation and subtraction. And <laughs> but, 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 you know, it's... Yeah. It's, it's, you know, the, next, the next ones are, like, solid yeah. and void. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, look, I mean, also... I think the first thing, and maybe to go back uh, again to just to the previous question for a second, is that I think it's also important that like an exhibition doesn't explain things too much, you know, because in Gordon Fredo and I talk about this all the time. It's like sometimes like we have like we're twisted like deep, deeply rooted in the Enlightenment that we think like explaining things like um, fixes things or that changes things, and and so I think it's it's you know you can kill things by explaining them too much, and actually I guess that's what's interesting about. Um, the concept of rights of future generations to me is that, you know, ultimately it does something where the effective register and the logical register don't actually align very often, or if they align, or if, when, they, when they misalign, that misalignment is kind of productive. Mm -hmm. And I think probably the same thing is true for thinking about the, the, the idea of how issues of um, inheritance, or mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. might function, or the question of the generation might function. Um, from, from a disciplinary perspective, I think like 
on one hand, the, the, the kind of deconstruction of the concept of shelter um, is because it's, it's really a way of um, pre-formatting, to go back to Mark's first question, um, vision. Yeah, so when we see something, you know, what, 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 do we, what do we see when we see it? And it's, kind of a, it's a kind of pre-formatting that makes us just see the hut repeat everywhere. Um, and, and so then in that sense, also simply just draws our attention, I think, away from other kinds of things that might be really interesting, um, that might not look like shelters, but might qualify um, for thinking architecturally mm -hmm. um, because of other kinds of criteria, because um, societies intervene in the world in certain kinds of ways. They manipulate their environments spatially in certain kinds of ways, and they organize themselves socially around those manipulations. Yeah, so that would kind of be a, a maybe let's say a very broad definition. So on one hand, shelter just, you know, stops us looking at those kinds of things, and I think those kinds of things might be really interesting to look at. Um, and then, of course, there is a, there's a kind of, within, within the very idea of genealogy itself, um, it's a really rich, rich theme. So, um, for example, another part of the lecture which I completely stripped out was um, a whole bunch of research we're doing on the visualization of family trees, mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting. Like, what, you know, it's not ob immediately obvious that you would use um, an arborescent tree diagram to represent kinship. Um, how did that? Well, how did that come to power? Why was it that a kind of tree became the main figure to explain things like kinship? And of course, it's not just mm -hmm. kinship, but it plays a incredible, like an incredibly important role in the way we start to think about knowledge, um, the way we start to think about taxonomy. Um, in fact, not just the organisation of knowledge, but also in some way the beginning of the idea of the museum and therefore of exhibition making in certain mm -hmm. kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. So in fact, the, the genealogical theme um, is, is somehow also at the heart of the curatorial project from, mm -hmm. um, from, from, from its inception. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I I'm not sure what else to, to kind of to say about that in terms, of, um, in terms of architecture in a disciplinary sense, but maybe Mark, you were... Yeah. Oh, you you looked like you were gonna say something, I, I don't yeah. know. Um, save me. We should ask yeah. the audience to, to but, but just, yeah. I can't also, I, I, you know, so many things I can't let go of, but the, <laughs> but the FLN, mm -hmm. the, uh, the burning of the archive yeah. in order to protect mm -hmm. it from the FLN, and in, it, so you describe this as a precondition, the mm. destruction of destruction, and so all of the discussion about epistemologies, organization of knowledge, cataloging, it's hard not to see those archives mm. as representative of that as well. And yeah. so when the lecture starts, mm. and the project starts, mm. within the ashes of the archive, I start to wonder what that's doing for you conceptually, mm. programmatically, and, and representationally. In, yeah. in, in, beca because at one level we understand, let's say, the willful destruction of these places of information concentration as an act of violence, but we also understand this as an analogy to mm. other forms of willful destruction that you have led us through mm -hmm. throughout the lecture. And so there's some kind of correlation between the archive and I don't know. I mean, it's a loose association, environmental damage, etc. Yeah. But it's also hard not to think of that protective membrane that holds together the archive as a kind of shelter. Yeah. And and so I'm just trying to figure out like what does that mean to ground the, sh the dismantling of structure on a form of violence enacted yeah. against a structure. And, and so I, I know it's a complicated yeah. set of relationships, but... No, I don't, I think, I don't think it's complicated. I think it's, it's actually it makes an incredible amount of sense. I th look, the, on, uh, there's two answers to it. One is very yeah. practical. One is that uh, this is a research-based exhibition, um, and so there are just really practical challenges around doing research. You know, the, the things that you can't take for granted, you know, if, you know, if, if um, you know, there's, three city blocks worth of archives, you know, ab above us, below us, <laughs> above us. Um, so, you know, one of the largest collections of architectural material in the world. Um, and, 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 you know, if, if, and for your students, um, if, if you want to send them to do research on the history of, um, you know, 
campus architecture, you know, there's literally hundreds of mm -hmm. things that you can refer them to. Um, you know, those same kinds of records are simply non-existent in certain parts of the world. Yeah. So that just makes architectural education really challenging. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, as, as part of doing the research for Sharjah, and I didn't mention this, but um, uh, we're doing three streams of research on the city of Sharjah itself. One is on housing, one is on education, one is on the environment. And you know, we have mm -hmm. students who are kind of breaking into buildings and taking photos of fire escape plans and translating them into drawings mm. just because we need the plan of a school building mm. and it's just not available. Um, <laughs> so can you imagine how laborious that is? To just do, so, so that's the kind of practical aspect of it. The second aspect, I think, which is more kind of conceptually important is that also what we mean by the archive is clearly not just libraries, yes, right? Exactly. Um, it's clearly not just manuscripts and documents. Um, and in fact, what is so fascinating about the question of environmental destruction is that we know that an archive might be the level of CO2 trapped in an air bubble in an ice core, and that might tell you something about the genocide of South America in the you know, 16th century. So that's, you know, like actually, the stratigraphy of the earth is continually registering violence in different kinds of ways. So it's not that um, that's a kind of, let's say, particularly classical portrait of what is an archive today. Um. I just have one, I, uh, I don't really have a well-formulated question here, but I, I really um, uh, like the, de the dedication that to our non-contemporaries um, uh, with which you open the lecture and I, and I um, very fascinated by the the futurity, you know, that mm. is um, embedded certainly in the title in terms of the rights of future generations, and and I yeah in a minute, and I uh, yeah just let me absolutely you're the first question, um, <laughs> and um, and I really appreciated the the recognition that um, uh, that rights discourse and human rights discourse already always already implies a type of future, but. Yeah. It's not necessarily a knowable future in so far as we also know that the, the types of rights, like the types of categories of humans that are included in mm. human rights have changed, including yeah. the rights of women and the rights of, yeah. you know, that. So, so, um, uh, the, so there's this type of unknowability about that future that, that refuses any possibility to plan that future and yet at the mm. same time demands that we take responsibility for that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it uh, keeps reminding me, of course, that um, on the one hand, there's the um, imperative to script, you know, hope or futurity in the sense of opening up new possibilities, mm. um, whether or not they remain sort of indebted to uh, existing or prior institutional structures like the United Nations or the Biennale, at, mm. uh, you know, architecture as a discipline. Mm. Um, but on the other hand, just I, I don't know how to connect this, but, you know, architecture, of course, architects are also always and already custodians of the future. That's yeah. what architects do. Yeah. They, they build futures, they imagine yeah. better futures, they script possible futures. Um, uh, uh, also, though, with different degrees of, of fidelity to the present in the yeah. terms of present norms, present institutional structures, yeah. present social expectations. And, and so, you know, there's then different models of futurity, some of which yeah. follow a sort of futurological in the sense of, you know, dreaming something different but embedded within the norms of the present. Yeah. Others are about perpetuating the present. Others yeah. about, you know, radical type of discontinuity or uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so like, trying to um, think about, you know, what lessons there might be from architects and the, the sort of futurity of architecture and the, the type of hope that motivates um, yeah. a lot of work in the discipline, yeah, to yeah. think otherwise, to produce yeah. otherwise, to imagine um, something else. Uh, I'm wondering whether yeah. there's something about the different forms of futurity, again, if we hold back the futurology of Mikhail and these sort of characters and mm. think with other moments in the field that could help us think about that, um, that yeah, the, Relation of the, the the rights question. To mm -hmm. I know this is a no, no, really terrific. clumsy connection, but but it seems like you know architects have a type of creative intelligence vis-a-vis -vis yeah. the future um, that institutions like the UN um, mm. may not yet. You know, I don't mm. know. I'm not saying lawyers aren't creative. That's not my point. But but you know. No, no. I, I think you're uh, right. Look, uh, I, I, it's it. And, and what you're saying, which is that the future. Mm. 
like futurity takes place in different keys. Yeah. Yeah. And like that's that's incredibly important um, mm -hmm. to to be sensitive to to those keys. Um, so f so for example. One of the things that's, that I think is very important within um, the work on rights of future generations is, is that it's not just the idea of rights and generations that become destabilized and open up to different perspectives, but that the idea of the future itself becomes um, open to different kinds of perspectives. And there's different versions of like what those perspectives might be. So for example, Matthias Fritsch, who I, I quoted um, in his book, comes at it through Levinas and Derrida and will say, well, you know, um, man is a kind of being unto life and death, and therefore, because we are, we outlive others, and people outlive us. Um, therefore, that our there is no such thing as the present, or that the present is always being claimed by other forms of temporality, yeah, by 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 the others around us. And so, so in fact, the present is never self present to itself. Right? And so he says, well, actually, that renders less anomalous, let's say, the way a, a way of thinking future generations. So that could be like, let's say, one version of futurity. Mm -hmm. The other the other versions of future which I think are also really important, come to us from um, indigenous studies as well. So, for example, the idea of reincarnation. Um, and so, you know, this triennial is going to have projects on reincarnation. There's going to be projects, you know, which I think is a really fascinating thing. Um, why? Because what does reincarnation do? It means that there is a substitutability in a kind of generational sequence that someone can return as it were, from the past into the present. Um, and that does really interesting things to social groups. For example, it breaks the filial line mm -hmm. because suddenly you might be a, a relative to <laughs> someone else or, yeah, well, it's normally within humans, but potentially within um, with, with, with other species as well. So there is a... So that question of substitutability becomes important. Um, but also the role of the dead and practices around caring for the dead. Um, so things like burial practices, cremation, exhumation, um, are also gonna figure within, within the triennial because I think they also speak to different modes of futurity, um, different ways of, let's say, um, tending toward a future. What, what implications those kinds of things have for architecture, I think, is a really open question. I don't know. But, but I think you're, you're right to point out to something that's actually really fundamental about architecture, which I think is one of its real powers, is that it's propositional. Um, you know, and that, that's where I think it's, in a way, really much more interesting than anthropology, for example, mm -hmm. because, you know, anthropologists and anthropology have spent, you know, decades agonizing over the location of the anthropologist within the ethnographic context and the role of observations and the kind of distortion of the field that's brought about by the role of the, you know, by ethnographic practice, etc. You know, architects, for better or worse, it's not always for better, um, um, have, uh, are always thinking through intervention. Yeah, I think and that, that's kind of something that's in a way fundamentally at the kind of core of the way that we see the world. And I think that's, I think there's a kind of power with that, no? It's like, it's not like knowledge is out there and then you, um, and then you go and you kind of like scoop up that knowledge. And it's like you disturb something in the world and then you study how it responds and then you learn something from that disturbance. I think it's a kind of different attitude toward knowledge production. Andres actually is first and then, yeah. I was fascinated by this uh, idea of moving from uh, geographies to two problematic uh, conditions. And, uh, and, and also with the, the possibility of thinking of the articulation or the uh, coexistence of contemporarity uh, with non -con or the contemporary with the non-contemporary. Mm -hmm. And I, I, through your presentation, there's a, a series of moments in which you, are, you were addressing actually this uh, shift like you were moving, for instance, from this way of dealing with next generations to the uh, encounter of intergenerational uh, uh, different generation, intergenerationality. And you were also thinking of the, at one point, that uh, kind of human time would encounter the time of the environment or other actors. Uh, yeah. And that was supposed to, uh, in, in many moments, to a notion of colonialism that was very much linear in terms mm. of time, and that mm. was very much about expansion and about, uh, mm. and, and that was part of the making of all the characterization of uh, 
the other as a sort of uh, resource. Mm. I'm, I'm following on this because that is a very uh, sophisticated way of moving from a modern time to a, let's say, a, a time of politics or a time of where mm. the inquiry into the modes of existence is, mm. is relevant. But triennials are very much also kind of insisting of this mm. kind of linear time. Mm -hmm. So I wonder what's the way that you can decolonize the actual notion of time that is put in play by triennials and biennials and the whole kind of even details of that, as you mentioned at the beginning of your talk, of PR agencies, uh, the yeah. rhetorics of that, all yeah. those things that are very much constituting what an exhibition like a triennial is yeah. about. That's a really good question. Um, this is a really good midterm crit. Um, <laughs> so let me, let me try to, to think through that really seriously. So I think the first thing is that by defining something in terms of problematic conditions, what I, what I don't want to fall into the trap of is kind of privileging the local. Yeah, because I think that is also a mistake. No? Um, and actually, there is something around. So, for example, we're doing a project on um, on on the Sahel, and actually, part of that is working with someone who's doing remote sensing. You know, and that's a kind of that, and that, so that very deterritorialized relationship to a condition is something that's very common to architects. You know. And you know, you're kind of not so different from like a drone pilot sitting somewhere in Virginia um, piling in a camera. If you're a you know, CAD operator in an architectural office and you're staring at a plan um, and in CAD for maybe a year, you, know, like you have an intensity of relationship to that. Now, I don't want to disqualify that as like an inauthentic relationship because you haven't been there or something. I think there's something in that kind of synthetic deterritorialized relationship to a site that is actually really important that, that we shouldn't somehow discount. Um, and so talking about conditions actually is a way of allowing that conflation of those different intensities that make, make something um, um, resonate. Th then in terms of like th thinking about um, the kind of contemporary and non-contemporary presence, I think there is, a, there is if your if your ancestors yeah are around you and the forest like what does contemporaneity mean so so if if we want if we want to allow other modes of existence to register then we have to throw the question of contemporaneity into doubt yeah because for many societies you know your ancestors are here or your ancestors might be a forest your ancestors might be indistinguishable from the landscape yeah that's one thing the third part of the question, which is on like the time of the triennial, I think is really challenging. Um, the only way I know how to respond to it is this, is that out of everything I've presented tonight, it's just a kind of setting into motion of a series of processes. Um, and we use the, the triennial as a kind of um, a pretext to set those things into motion. Those things, some of those things will, will, will fall into the triennial, others will escape. Um, some will use the triennial as a way of um, kind of amplifying them, of creating like a community of inquiry that will, you know, discussions that might continue beyond the life of the triennial, um, of maybe trying to at least formulate some problems in the field that we think are, that we think are important, whether it's to do with exhibition making or the absence of mediators in front of architectural projects, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but then in terms of like, what is the legacy? And so legacy is a bad way of framing time because like, but, but I think there's a, richer, there's a richer dimension to your project, a richer dimension to your question, um, which I'm not really capturing in the idea of legacy, but let's say if we frame it at least in the terms of legacy. One thing I didn't talk about tonight was, um, you know, there is a figure who I've been writing about for since, well, almost 2012 or 2010, um, which is Lumumba de Arping, who was the, this, this um, a Sudanese diplomat who represented the G77 at the 2009 Copenhagen Climate Conference. And I think he's one of the most kind of, one of the most important political interventions of our time. Um, um, basically scuttled Obama's deal, this kind of G8 deal, agreeing on a two degree temperature increase. Um, I've been working with Lumumba since July on something called a working group. So the working group's aim is to draft a charter on rights of future generations, which will be, you know, um, a series of working sessions. Um, at the conclusion of the working sessions, there'll be a summit in the opening week of the triennial and the charter will be produced. Um, and the idea there is to say, let's say, to, 
find a way of taking these various sites of social struggle that are, let's say, captured within the exhibition and to, in a way, create a kind of institutional vehicle that does, that in a way fulfills the potential of rights of gener future generations, which is to become a kind of populist concept in some ways. Yeah. Um, and so the idea is that the, the, the working group, in a sense, is a kind of vehicle to produce that. Yeah? I mean, the, the, the concept comes from international humanitarian law. Um, how do we make it return to the space of international humanitarian law in a really serious way? Um, so I see that as the, like one of the one of the ways in which the the time of the triennial um, outlives the, the time of the exhibition itself. But um, yeah, it's a there's like a, there's like an entire lecture on like public relations public relations companies <laughs> just the kind of just the kind of the, the structures of institutional power and and the kind of temporality of the various institutions involved in an, in exhibition making. Which, if you don't deconstruct and take seriously, um, I think it, they really end up overcoding, overdetermining so much of what you do in an exhibition. Um, even just take a simple example, right? Like even even just dis the circulation of publications. Yeah, um, Andrea, who's who's doing the, who's editing the books um, for us. You know, he was saying that if you want to move, if you want to move a, germ, a journal from South Africa to Nigeria, you know, passes through Europe, right? So, so it's, this is still a colonial circuit, right? Let alone how you start thinking about how those things might take place, how they might register or take on, have a kind of legacy outside of those circuits of institutional power. And you know, we're sitting in a, in a center of institutional power. I sit in a center of institutional power in London. So the, the question is like, on one hand, how do you how you'd like commit treason against your own institution, right? Because you know that every single time you enter into discussion, um, you have an asymmetry of control over, uh, you have a power to make things circulate, to represent things in ways that your interlocutors cannot, yeah? And there's a kind of fundamental ethical question around how we work from New York or from London in these kinds of contexts, no? That's exactly my question, pretty much. Um, <laughs> following up also on last night's provocation by Ananya Roy in planning, um, you who are our senior scholars and our leaders in the field, how do you decide how much to rock the boat or to break the boat? And which parts of the boat do you rock versus break? In what I understand in the, the way we do things and the things that we do. So for you all, for architects, I'm a planner. It's exhibitions, perhaps, for us. It's peer-reviewed articles or circulations of zoning technologies or other things. But we, we put those into question, yet you call the archives. There's a lack of archives, a lack of archives. And you are one of the leaders in showing us how me, at least as a planner, looks to you to see other forms of evidence as archive, right? Buildings, traces, so many other things. But yet we still understand this as a lack because it is a lack. Right? Um, and then secondly, thinking about education and, and your role as an educator, isn't it? I mean, this is from a point of, I've never been to an architectural exhibition in my life. <laughs> Complete naivete. But don't we pretty well know how people learn things and how their views, how their ways of seeing are shaken up? That's by doing, right? And by participating or by making mm -hmm. at the same time. Right? Yeah. And so why are, is it always about seeing something yeah in an exhibition why is that the way that it's talked about but it doesn't i, I yeah. think i think you're right an exhibition but i think an exhibition doesn't have to mean seeing things and, and there's all kinds of other forms of engagement or participation that an exhibition might structure from everything from public program to performance to workshops i mean i think it's doesn't doesn't need to mean looking at pictures or, or looking at things on the wall and, and to answer your first question which is like how do you decide where to apply pressure Right. Um, I think it's really ultimately just a, a question of how much time you have. You know, like you, you just make a pragmatic decision on the things that you can push and how far you can push them, and then you stop when you run out of time. I it's might really, also it's just it's really practical append <laughs> to Adrian's answer. I don't think we all know what seeing and learning is. I don't think yeah. we can assume that this has been coded and understood and formalized. I think probably 
the space of the exhibition of properly managed, conceived, and, and, and curated puts all of that into doubt so that that can be rethought and, mm -hmm. and, 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 um, and repoliticized. Uh, and, and, and so finding institutions that, through which that can happen is clearly an important task, or also finding ways in which you can put pressure on the institution in which you are attempting to do that is also an important task. But. Yeah, I mean, I mean, for example, like the, the great undone project in, on architectural exhibitions that actually maybe one of your students has done already is just to look at the political economy of the Venice Biennale. You know, I mean, non-architects in the audience, you maybe one probably don't, you know, may not be aware of this, but you know, ultimately the it's it's an incredibly exploitative system, and at the bottom of that system sit artists and architects, you know, and actually just to unpack the political economy of the Venice Biennale um, would be, I think, a really incredible project, and and yet most of the times that we talk about exhibitions, we slip into talking about content because the kind of institutional power and structure is somehow invisible. So how you make those things, how you render those things visible, um, I think is a really important question. We also kind of assume that, sorry, how we see and learn is, is in any way stable. And it, uh, it reminds me, um, this is a, Sort of anecdote from something we're reading in class um, yesterday. A beautiful text by Gyan Prakash, who's um, uh, 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 called "Museum Matters," and and there's a moment in his text where he turns to this sort of anecdote from a uh, Indian anthropological museum and anthropological museum in India. Do you know this text? Yeah, and he and he had uh, he had been following the natives around with the caliper to try and you know measure them and in his uh, you know very sort of British colonial way and. And when he encounters a group of indigenous people laughing at the representation, you know, by the West, it, like, like revealing the apparatus of the Western institution to him. And, and so mm. there are these moments that even something as stable as a, you know, Western sort of diorama, like, you know, comes to seem radically different, not yeah. only in the way it seems different to us now as the type of archaism that we enjoy and laugh at, but, you know, even in the moment of, uh, it's, you know, presentation supposedly as a functional type of <laughs> exhibition apparatus. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, the, the shifts in perspective, um, yeah. uh, you know, according to who's encountering it and yeah. how they're seeing it can dismantle the very assumption of what they're learning. Yeah, so they were supposed to be learning about, yeah. you know, how they as uh, colonial subjects are, you know, conceived. You know, what they're learning about is the British. And so, yeah. so I think, you know, there are, yeah, we don't know how things are seen and by whom, and so, yeah. yeah. Hi, Adrian. How are you? Well, how are you? <laughs> um, I really appreciated your presentation and your attention to uh, decolonial practice as a, a central organizing principle mm. for your curatorial strategy, and, and actually the way in which a decolonial practice leads to a much more expanded understanding of curatorial practice, and I just mm. wondered, whether you could share with us a little bit more about the process of mm. identifying curators and the kinds yeah. of projects that um, you want to throw resources at. Yeah, that's such a good question. And actually, so the question of like how, how you take resources um, from, from centers of institutional power and divert them, yeah, um, in aware of the kinds of always these asymmetries of power that you produce, right? Whenever you're working through these kinds of structures is, um, is incredibly important. I think there's no easy answer for it and I think we really struggle. You know, we really struggle because first of all, um, it's, it's really astonishing the degree to which the ways, the, the, the way, the degree to which value production in architecture is structured through these histories, yeah, and to try to to try to work outside of them, um, even to try to work out outside of, um, you know, all of the structures of value production, journals, magazines, you know, etc., 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 and and to then engage with other kinds of contexts is. I mean, I, 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 can't, I can't tell you how difficult we've found it, yeah? 
Um, so, I mean, there's obvious things, you, you know, you kind of, you travel, you speak to as many people as possible, um, you try to be um, clever in, 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 the, um, in your approach, you use a lot, you depend on a lot of informants in different places, um, and, and it's just like really work, yeah, it's time and work. Um, I think one other, one other way around it um, is to also, if, like, if architecture, yeah, which is a kind of, let's say the profession and the discipline of architecture, if it's, if it's evolution in the form that we know it, um, you can almost draw a line from the Renaissance to the present, right, in terms of, in terms of its disciplinary formation. Um, maybe one of the lessons from some of the, the work that I've been trying to do is that actually it's not really important that the people that are in the exhibition are architects, i.e. exist within that disciplinary formation, yeah. So for example, it might be an environmental activist, um, it might be a photographer, it might be an anthropologist, it might be et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, if what they're doing and if the, and if the, if the conditions that they're working in are somehow architectural and resonate within the context of the, um, of the exhibition, then it's an architectural project. It's, so, 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 for example, I don't feel a burden of like having to represent the profession in any way, um, and I don't. I also don't feel a burden of trying to be representative as well, because you know, even the like the idea of a survey is already to fall back into that into that gaze uh, um, that you somehow um, that kind of like nineteenth century version of of you know pavilions in Venice or, or, or whatever the case may be. Um, but, it, but it's a really difficult question. And we'll make a small inroad into it in Sharjah, mm -hmm. I hope. Mm -hmm. But that's probably the most we can expect. I think that's it. So thank you. Thank you, Adrian, and thank you all for coming out. Thank you. Thank you.